and in charge of the Cannabis Licensing Unit. I wanna give a brief uh, shout out to Jim Coffis who wants to make a quick announcement for Green Trade. Uh, so go ahead, Jim. Thank you, thank you. Oh, on the speaker. Oh. Jim. Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, so I just want to quickly uh, announce that Green Trade uh, is going to hold an event on May 9th, Wednesday, at the Resource Center for Nonviolence across the street here. Uh, it's going to be a workshop for uh, anybody that is uh, looking to jump into the licensing process. We're assembling a group of uh, service providers, attorneys, accountants, land use planners, uh, you name it, security uh, services, all the different things, uh, touchstones that you'll need uh, in order to fill out the applications both locally and at the state. So it'd be a good thing to put in your calendar, uh, keep an eye out for it. It's going to be uh, coming into compliance. And so it's May 9th. Uh, in the evening, 5.30 to 9 or so. Thanks. All right. So tonight's workshop was initiated by our state agency partners, um, and each of those people will be presenting a little bit later tonight. None of these partners here today are the licensing authorities. I wanna be very clear about that. Um, however, the idea was to give you a bit of a preview of some of the different approvals and agencies you'll be interacting with and things you'll be needing um, as you um, head down the path to legalization. Uh, tonight's workshop is not intended to go into detail on our ordinance, uh, which uh, was approved in concept on Tuesday, yay! Um, we expect that that ordinance will become final at the May 8th board meeting, and then go into effect 30 days later on June 8th. Tonight we'll give you a few highlights about that, but mostly we're here to help you understand some of the various um, parts of the process going forward in the licensing uh, process. So just briefly, a quick outline of tonight's meeting. Um, county staff will speak first, and then our state partners will present. They are the State Fish and Wildlife, the State Water Board, and the Regional Water Board. Um, we'd like to ask to hold questions uh, for everyone until everyone has completed their part of the presentation. And then I just wanna go over just a few quick guidelines. Um, we appreciate it if you could keep your questions to those general in nature. We're not gonna be able to answer site specific questions about your site. Um, however, our agency partners do have staff that are here and there's tables outside, so they're happy to help um, with more personal consultations on things if you need that. Um, so make yourself uh, use those resources if you need to. In addition, there's lots of informational flyers all over the tables out back, um, so pick those up, take a look at them, um, and that should help you as well. Um, I am going to be moderating the Q&A session, um, so I'll call on you, um, and then we'll need you to come, uh, and I'll have a wireless mic, we'll need you to speak into the microphone because we are recording this evening. Um, uh, also, just a brief reminder, turn off those cell phones, folks. Um, and if you do need to have conversations with other people, appreciate it if you'd step into the hall and away from the door because the noise, this little redwood thing here, carries the noise into the room. It's a very, um, it's like a little echo chamber and then it gets hard to hear, so appreciate that. So this session, as I said, is being recorded live and we will post it along with the PowerPoints on our cannabis licensing website. And I also wanna give a brief plug to the Micro Business Summit that the county is holding on May 4th, Friday. Um, this is a great opportunity for those small businesses to learn about things such as money for startups, um, marketing, cash flow strategies, um, and other topics. So I really encourage you to go to the microbusinesssummit.com website, take a look at the schedule, um, and if you're interested, attend that May 4th at Cabrillo College. All right, that's enough for me. I want to first identify our staff tonight. So first off, uh, Vasant Charmant, he is in code compliance. Uh, Michael Sapenauer and Loretta Moreno, oh, Loretta stepped away, but you know Loretta. Um, they are our resource planners. You've probably, if you've done a pre-licensing inspection, you've probably met some of these people already. And then of course, finally, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our cannabis licensing manager, Robin Bolstergrant. Thanks very much. Oh, sure. Stop it. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Um, as uh, Melody said, Tuesday was a big day for us. Um, uh, it was almost anti climatic. We've been working really hard, uh, as you probably know, to get our uh, ordinances in some state of, of finality. Um, so in concept, uh, approved by the board, and as Melody said, um, they will uh, return on the 8th uh, and uh, formally adopt the, the ordinance. I should mention this is one of those details that may or may not um, be readily apparent, but um, when, they, uh, when they adopt it, it will be in effect outside the coastal zone. So the Coastal Commission gets to weigh in on the ordinance. Uh, ordinance says we've had lots of conversations with them, so I don't anticipate any problems, but if, uh, if a property is in the coastal zone, they will not be able to move forward quite as quickly. So just uh, sort of a point of clarification there. Uh, let's see. And then again, 30 days after outside the coastal zone, um, it will be in effect and we will be uh, hopefully ready to take in applications. So some of the major changes, uh, and, and a lot of you folks, if you've been following along, um, you, you know about these, but for those uh, who haven't, um, this is, these are changes that have happened over just really the past few months. Um, some of the more important pieces, uh, the cottage garden license was a category that was added by the Planning Commission in March. Um, Site-specific environmental review, so each license application will also need a permit and they will be responsible for completing environmental review. Um, I've had a lot of questions about whether individual projects um, need to do an EIR. Um, that is incredibly unlikely. Um, CEQA review, environmental review, um, covers, it, it, it's the analysis, it's just information gathering. Um, for many projects, depending on the scope, it could be, you could be exempt, um, you may need to do some review, but an EIR is incredibly unlikely um, for most projects, for the majority of the projects. Um, Let's see what else up there. Um, co-location is something that came along um, relatively recently. That is having multiple licensees on a single parcel. Um, and master plans enable uh, adjacent parcels to share infrastructure. Um, these are things that came out of the EIR that we did um, and uh, hopefully will minimize new disturbance, new development. That's always a goal of ours. And then the BMOP, the very last uh, bullet point there, the best management and operations plan. Everyone will be required to submit one of those with their application, and we can talk more in detail. I'm gonna go pretty quickly through some of the rest of this. Um, the program started with cultivation. And here's just a rundown. Again, I'm gonna go through this. I should mention that this whole PowerPoint will be available um, on our website, on our Facebook page. Uh, if you haven't availed yourselves of those, uh, those resources, we, we put a lot of information on those. And, and so this, you don't have to take notes. Um, all of this will, will be available to you. Um, so these are um, the cultivation license types and the zoning where cultivation can take place. Um, this is all pretty consistent with what we've been talking about for, for many Many months. Um, the minimum parcel size, again, this is fairly consistent. The changes had to do with special use, that's SU. It went away, it came back with restrictions. Um, I'm, I, I think we landed in a pretty good place. And, and all of this, as you folks know, is the, our attempt to, to balance the needs of the industry against, uh, well, not always against, but with, um, we're all, it's collaborative, right? Um, with neighborhoods and, and environmental uh, protection. The cottage, again, the cottage uh, license came up um, relatively recently and we're, we're happy about that. Minimum parcel size for a cottage license is two and a half acres. And there are other restrictions that go along with that. Maximum canopy limits. Um, you can see that we've broken down uh, a single license versus co-location. Um, for a lot of zone districts, we really wanted to incentivize co-location, so we expanded the canopy limits. So if you can grab somebody else uh, on a parcel, and um, again, it's about uh, minimizing new development and, and new disruption. And then the canopy limits for some of the other zone districts. 
So um, RATP, uh, and again, we can, we can go through any specifics, but this is just a, a kind of an overview I'm gonna go through uh, quickly. Cottage license, 500 square foot is the canopy limit. Um, so everybody who, to be eligible for a license, you have to either have registered with us and that was um, the, the period uh, toward the end of 2016, um, and you have to show that you've been cultivating in the county uh, prior to January 1st, 2013. Um, you can also be eligible if you are a non-cannabis farmer with three years um, uh, history of cultivating non-cannabis. What if you're a farmer for like three years and I would love to answer your questions when we're done, I'm sorry. Um, Hold your question. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to there. there every, every part of this will spawn a ton of questions. And so this is our first attempt. We're going to have more workshops. We're going to, you know, dial into a lot of this stuff further. We just got the ordinance two days ago, and we're, we're, we're trying to put this, uh, <laughs> quickly give you an overview. Um, although I never quick at anything. So, um, so the 2013 date comes up a lot in, um, in areas that are more remote and, and residential, the SU, which is special, special use. Um, there are restrictions that require that you establish that there has been cultivation on that site. The, the Planning Commission, the board, were really concerned about folks coming into sites brand new. They really didn't want to see that in a lot of cases. So that, that date um, looms pretty, pretty large in, in many cases. And the cottage, uh, again, the cottage license has a lot of restrictions on it. Um, and this comes from the fears that, that were expressed about what it means to have a commercial uh, business in a residential area. And a lot of it is based on people's perceptions and fears and, you know, we'll, we'll show them what it really looks like at some point. Um, not that they're not all founded, but... Um, uh, there we go. <laughs> Manufacturing um, license type. Sorry, again, we kind of put this together a little quickly. Um, so there are three three classifications: uh, infusion, uh, extraction, non-volatile, and then uh, volatile extraction. Um, the zone districts for each of those basically, um, you know, match the, the the impacts associated with those kinds of, of activities. Um, no ethanol or CO2 in, um, in smaller RA parcels. And, and the, the key is the second point there, I think. Um, if you're um, manufacturing in sites that are not commercial or industrial, it has to be connected to cultivation that you're doing. Um, and there are restrictions about um, employees that you have. And um, again, we can go into, into more detail on this. Um, if you're in a commercial area, you can be a standalone manufacturer. And then distribution. Um, we got to this kind of kind of late. Didn't realize how important this was. Um, now we do. Um, so class one, class two. You either are distributing your own products, cannabis or cannabis products, or you're distributing for somebody else in addition to yourself. Uh, and then again, the, the zoning. Um, these are if you're doing your own manufacturing, cultivation, um, and just uh, distributing your own, there are more choices for you where you can be. Um, if you're like a hub for many other um, suppliers, then um, you have to be in one of the commercial or, or manufacturing areas. And let's see. Um, yeah, some other, some other things that, that come up a lot. The coastal zone plus one mile buffer. Um, that is sort of a sacrosanct area, and it's really limited um, uh, for, for cultivation, um, particularly, I guess, for everything. You have to be in an existing legal structure, so, and that's going to help us get through the Coastal Commission and their review, because we're saying we're not allowing new development in, in the coastal zone, um, and the one mile buffer got tacked onto that. Um, this is a while ago. Um, I think no public access. That's pretty straightforward, um, and setbacks are 
are a whole other issue that we can talk about because I know that those are those are concerns. But there are setbacks to um, sensitive receptors, so habitable structures, schools, parks, riparian zones. There's a there's a, a range of setbacks, um, and all of these things are things that we will be analyzing with you and and helping you kind of walk through what your project looks like and 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 helping you scope it so that um, so that you're in compliance. And I think I will turn it over to Loretta. Thanks. Okay. Hello, Loretta Moreno, resource planner. Uh, so Robin's covered in a very warp speed manner um, the, the ordinance that uh, the two ordinances that have been adopted But I just want to really clarify for everyone that there are two ordinances you need to read together You can't read one and not the other or you might have problems. So the two work together one is more of a uh, operational licensing restrictions and operational requirements and then the other ordinance 1310 is what we call it, um, is the zoning ordinance that the planning department implements. And that's gonna be where you find, you know, your parcel size that you need, what you can do in what zone district. You'll get familiar with that. And we're gonna have interpretive materials to help you with this as well, for sure. But read them together. And also, don't forget our little BMOP, which has a lot of um, kind of upfront measures to minimize potential environmental impacts of any cannabis business. Um, so just best management practices, but required of the operator. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this. There's a little more text than I'm gonna actually articulate, but um, we have kind of four pieces to the best management operational practices. Um, one is citing criteria. So up front, before you go and draft all your plans and design your structures with engineers or whoever you're gonna work with to get this put together, um, depending on what you wanna do, you, you need to find an optimal location that minimizes environmental impacts and protects neighborhoods, and we have criteria that capture that intention. Um, restrictions on the grading you can do. You can't have a cannabis cultivation site on 35% slopes, for example. You can't grade limit with limitless, um, without boundary, you know. Um, we want to avoid forest fragmentation where feasible. That's where Michael Sapinor and I come in and also the planning department will weigh in on how to avoid chopping up the forest unnecessarily. We're gonna wanna get your footprint as tight and uh, well located as possible of your development and uh, roads and everything. Avoiding sensitive biological resources. This is our goal. Um, and then the next piece of the best management operational practices, BMOP um, is what we call it for short, is site design. So once you've kind of located where you wanna be, how you design your site, where you're placing your fencing for both security and also maybe to avoid wildlife, um, wildlife intruding on your crop or what have you. Um, we wanna protect um, the wildlife in the area. So we wanna minimize nighttime lighting um, that intrudes on wildlife uh, natural behavior. Um, and also the fencing requirements may be, you know, um, to prevent the need to, for example, want to use rodenticides. Most people don't seem to wanna be using those. They're actually not legal at the state level, but for the public, we wanna make sure they understand that you're protecting your crop proactively. Um, and uh, yeah, water resource protection and efficiency measures taken. The next piece is construction requirements. Just briefly, how you are constructing your, when you're in construction mode, how you protect wildlife like nesting birds if applicable, working hours, you can't do the construction at two in the morning, things of that nature. And then the last piece are operational requirements. So what we wanna do is um, uh, capture your day to day. Um, what your employees are doing, uh, their protection and safety on a day-to-day -day basis, um, things like that. Um, again, I think I already, I guess I mixed a few things up, but the night lighting and hazardous material storage, things, things like this you wanna um, be aware in this document and you're gonna have to put a packet together addressing these questions. So, um, you know, most of you all, all know this, but you, you're working with the state to get a state license and you're working with us to get your local license. Um, the County of Santa Cruz uh, Cannabis Licensing Office and Planning Department will work together to help you get your legal um, local uh, license and then you go to the state with this. So just to be clear on that process, not everyone realizes. And then now Robin is gonna explain <laughs> this Little chart, this is a flow chart that, <laughs> I don't wanna do this part. Robin is gonna explain this piece. This is just how the flow of your permits are gonna go, just so you get a taste for um, the process to come. <laughs> you have to point that way to Oh, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't working so well. Um, don't be alarmed. Um, <laughs> 
our whole goal in, I mean, we've had to track where the ordinances went and what we did with uh, environmental review and CEQA and all that, and so it, it, it ended up with this bifurcated process where you're getting both a license from the licensing office and a use permit from planning. Um, I worked in planning for 16 years. I know a lot about their process, um, and and you're always going to start with us. So so to just boil this down uh, into simple concepts, you start with us, and we scope your project. We need a description. You need to tell us, and and a, a plan that's not you know like a cocktail napkin with crayon on it. That's like a real plan, and and you know describe all the elements of of your project, and we will tell you exactly what you need to submit to planning and for us. And you will take everything, you'll come back and say, I did, I did what you told me, I got all the stuff I need. I have my biotic study, I have engineered or, or architect drawn plans, I have my, my BMOP, I have all of these things, now I'm ready. And we'll send you with the canna clearance it's way too cute, uh, at the bottom left, saying you've got everything. We're not analyzing it in, in super, super detail. We're just saying that you have checked all the boxes that we told you to check. You're, you're, you're ready to submit. And, and then you will go down to the planning department and submit. Um, and at the same time, we'll be working on the licensing piece. And the licensing piece comes last, right? So you, you have to get through the, the use approval process and, and that involves sending copies of your plans and your, your program statement to various other agencies, environmental health, public works, the Ag Commission, right? All these other folks are gonna weigh in and say that looks good or you you need this or that. Just like any other discretionary process. I wanna you know, make sure that you know we're not, we're not picking on cannabis. This is really what everybody has to go through. Not the, not the licensing piece, but the, but the, the discretionary process. If you were opening up a, a coffee store, um, you would store, shop. I'm so tired, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a coffee store is. Um, you would have to go through the same process. So a lot of applications are gonna need um, a, a public hearing. That's the way that the ordinance uh, was written if you're in one of the more remote areas or if you're in a, a residential area, anything really except for the, the commercial and manufacturing type zone districts, you're probably gonna need a public hearing. But we are going to give you all the information that you need. We're not your consultants. You will need consultants, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is not a do-it-yourself kind of uh, proposal. There, there are a lot of technical pieces to this and I wouldn't try to do this and I, like I said, I've been working planning for a really long time. I would hire somebody who knows and understands how permitting works or at least engineer, biologist, some of the other folks that you're gonna need, you're gonna need a team. And our job is, again, not to be your consultant, not even really to, to make sure you're successful, it's to give you all the information that you need so you can make the right choices about the scope of your project and about how you move forward. All right, so I don't know what else I wanted to say about that, that was like a little manifesto, I just didn't mean to go there. Um, well, just uh, we have a lot of folks come in and say, you know, how do I how do I start? Well, we can give you the tools, but we can't run your project for you. So, and that's hard if you haven't been through the the permitting process. Santa Cruz is very liberal in lots of ways. They embrace legalization of cannabis, but you notice we don't have a Walmart. We don't have a lot of development. So, development has always been a challenge in in this county, whether it's cannabis or not. Uh, application again, that's, we'll, we'll help you with that. We'll have um, more information um, as we get closer to the effective date in June. We'll have application packets. We'll give you an idea of what we're looking for. A lot of that stuff is already in the BMOP and, and already sort of you can intuit by reading through the ordinance as well. Uh, I gave you a <laughs> spiel on consultants, sorry. Um, Time and fees. Um, we haven't set the fees. The, the fees have to be approved by the board. Um, the budget process um, we're coming up on. So we'll have an idea of what the fees are uh, in June. Um, 
we realize we don't want to make them so prohibitive that people disappear, um, but we have to pay for a program. So, so we're going to try to find that sweet spot and, and, and make it something that's doable for as many people as possible. Um, the time that it takes to process is largely dependent on the scope of work and how diligent um, you folks are in putting together the things that we need. Um, so I don't know what else to say about the time piece, but efficiency is, is our goal, I promise. And, and, and this bifurcated um, piece um, will be streamlined to the extent that we can. Um, and oh, um, so the pre-license inspections, and this just applies to the, the cultivation. Um, we promised folks who did pre-license inspections that they got priority process, processing. Um, and so we're honoring that. So the first applicant pool will be from the PLI list. Um, first in, you know, get, gets the first, first crack. Um, and we'll set up a schedule, it'll be appointment only. We wanna make sure we're not totally overwhelmed. Um, and we'll, we'll let you know wh when that starts, but um, we'll get to everybody as, as quickly as we can. The interim piece is really important for folks um, that uh, we, we're having people say, you know, I got my license, and so now, you know, no, we haven't issued any licenses. We have issued some folks who are existing operators um, uh, local authorization letters, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but the idea was we wanted to make sure that folks were who were already in operation, who basically complied with uh, environmental protection and other rules, weren't shut down, and so we gave folks a letter that they could submit to the state for a temporary state license. Um, those are starting to run out for some folks. Um, we are in conversation with the state. We don't run the state's process, but they know that people are coming up against a sort of eek, now what do I do? Um, we have ideas about bridging that for folks, again, if you're in operation and you're basically compliant with all the rules, we wanna do our part to make sure, to the extent that we can, that you can continue to be in operation without expanding um, and, and, and still qualify for either extending your temp license. Um, I, I've already started to get some increase from the state on, on annual licensing, so um, I guess that's still just to, to extend, so I'm sorry if I'm, speaking past um, some folks, but the people that have gone through the, the temporary licensing process um, have real concerns about continuing. So just know that we're talking to folks and, and, and they're, they're doing their part because they know that a lot of jurisdictions like Santa Cruz are not ready for prime time. And so we don't have licenses to give uh, to everybody just yet, obviously. Um, um, more workshops, at least, one more before we start taking in applications, and then after that we'll have we'll have more of these. Um, I will have gotten some sleep, and I will be much more coherent, and um, and we'll know more. Um, the the first uh, the first pool uh, of, of folks that come in will be like we all have been sort of guinea pigs, and and we'll be sitting down with planning with the environmental planners that work downstairs, and we'll be sort of um, you know doing a, a team evaluation to sort of see what works, um, and, and then we'll have more information to, to give you. But, but workshops and outreach are, are gonna be a huge part of, of what we do, obviously. Um, educational materials, we're working on that. Um, right now, read the ordinances, read through the BMOP, um, that really will give you an idea of the things that we're, that we're looking for. Um, it's not all the stuff that the state is asking for. We can answer some of those questions, but not all. Um, the nice folks here can answer some of those on behalf of what the state is looking for. Um, build your team. You're gonna need help. And, um, and, and you know, ask us questions, but again, not that sort of should I go forward or not. I'm not gonna answer that. <laughs> I get that a lot, it's weird. Like, what do you think I should do, Robin? I don't, I don't know. I don't wanna take on that responsibility. I'll tell you what it means if you do this versus that and what that process looks like. But you guys all have to make business decisions. Go to the expo, find out if you don't already, um, how to write a business plan, how to do a marketing plan. You know, be like business people, which you are. Um, but make your own decisions. 
but we'll help. Um, do anything else? Uh, oh, there it is. There's the plug, Micro Business Summit. Go, sign up. It's cheap. Okay, that's all I have. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, and now we're gonna move on to, uh, one second, actually, who wants to go first? <laughs> Fish and Wildlife, you want to give it over? Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with Fish and Wildlife, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have some message to deliver. They have a message to deliver to you, and they kind of want to go over some basics about permitting again and refresh you. So we have um, Heather McIntyre from Fish and Wildlife, and she's a senior environmental scientist with Fish and Wildlife. Thank you, Loretta. What's the magic button? Oh, oh right there. Okay. Right back. And point it that way. <laughs> Melody, look out. <laughs> All right, thank you. So California is really unique in the nation. We have the highest biodiversity of any other state in the nation. Oh, look, I'm making the mouse move. Maybe I should put that down. Okay. <laughs> and and it's, it's, we are so unique. We have the highest diversity of plants, fish, wildlife and habitats. We have redwood and sequoia forests. We have some of the most productive farmlands in the nation. We have, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful coastlines as well. And Santa Cruz is really a microcosm of all these things that we have here in California, which makes you very special and very unique. And so today I'm going to I'm going to be speaking mostly to cultivators. When you are a cultivator, that's where you need to come talk with us. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our thought processes and what we think about as we're going through applications and provide you with some options on how to proceed with an application or a notification and what you'll need to do that. Good news is there's a lot of overlap between what we need and what the county needs. And so you're going to be able to use a very large proportion of what you're preparing for the county to process and move forward with us. Um, so so when, we think, when we think at the department level about resource protection, we're looking, first of all, at an individual site. We're looking very site specifically about that. Um, for example, um, if we're looking at a, at, a, um, at a diversion, we're gonna look at the size of that diversion and maybe what species are in the area. But in the back of our mind, we're also gonna be thinking about the impacts potentially from a watershed perspective. Uh, where does this stream that you're diverting from go? How important is that portion of water to that stream where it's going? What animals are gonna be, be affected by that? So we start looking specific, site specifically, we start thinking watershed and we go forward uh, from there. But this is just kind of how our minds operate when we're talking with you. So again, we start looking first at site specific concerns and then we'll start thinking about cumulative impacts. That is part of our role is to evaluate cumulative impacts as well. So some of the questions that we get asked are, uh, what is a stream? Well, a stream can be a couple of things. One, it can be what you expect, water flowing down across your property. That is definitely a perennial stream that we work with. You may also have an episodic stream or a stream that's dry, maybe most of the year, or maybe it only has flowing water when you have a storm or some good rainfall. There's also an ephemeral stream, which is, you know, it's very desert, uh, it may be, that there's only water in that once every five or 10 years. Probably not here in Santa Cruz, but these are all streams and these are all things that the department uh, is interested in talking with you about if they're on your property. Summer flow from a stream is especially important. Um, we have, uh, we, we're very concerned about the quality of the stream and the quality of the habitat as the water is going through. Our concerns are if there's a uh, significant reduction in water flow in the summer, then that stream is gonna become less productive, there's gonna be less food, there's gonna be a lot less oxygen, and these are all not good things to help us maintain this unique biodiversity that we have in California. Wrong button. Uh-oh. Thank you. So another question that we get asked frequently is what is substantial? And this is a little trickier. This is a very site-specific question so when we're looking at a site, and again, I'm using um, a diversion, we look at everything this way. Um, so where is the diversion? 
How big is the diversion? Uh, are, is it in listed species habitat? Uh, when are the diversions occurring? And how big is it? How much water is being drawn? And we kind of look at all these things and piece them together to determine if an effect is substantial. And it's very site specific, it's very individual specific, it's not a, a single solid criteria where we can say X, Y, and Z. We need to look at each facility individually. And the, and the reason we do this, and this is, goes back to kind of how we think. So we look, we look at um, your facility or a facility and we think about it in context with others and others within a watershed and we're looking at cumulative impacts. So uh, 2012, 2016. You can see in 2016 a lot more uh, habitat loss, a lot more habitat fragmentation. Um, these are gonna cause much larger impacts to local species. These are the kinds of things we think about when we're evaluating facilities. Same, uh, light, light pollution um, before and after. This can cause biological consequences. These are important things that we need to keep track of. So get permitted, <laughs> that's, the, that's the good news. And uh, again, we are working primarily with cultivators, cultivators only. Uh, this is to let you know that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife requires that you notify us and talk to us about your, your project. And then in addition to that, the California Department of Food and Ag requires you to have something from us in order to get their license. And what you need from us is either an agreement or you need a letter stating that you don't need an agreement and we can talk about how we get there. The challenging thing is, is that I would say maybe some of the businesses have been around maybe five or 10 or 20 years and they're existing. So when you look at our page and we look into notification or the application process, you'll say, well, I'm not doing construction. I'm not installing a culvert. But I have one on my property and I use it to access my grow, but I'm not installing one. And even though you're not installing it, as part of coming into compliance, you need to tell us about it. And we include that in your notification, we include that in your agreement, and then you're covered. So it's a little, a little weird there because when other people come to us for an uh, agreement, it's because they're doing construction. And as we bring the cultivators into compliance, we need to know what you have now. So there's a little bit of a difference thing. But do bear in mind that what we're asking you to do is not different of what we ask anyone else to do who is doing uh, construction in the stream or in the area. Oh, that's what I was gonna say here. <laughs> so we, that we're asking you to do the same things we ask everyone else. So activities that require an agreement. Um, if, if you are um, working in a stream bed, installing, or in your case, maybe have a culvert on your property, if you're changing, removing riparian vegetation, we wanna know about it, just include it. When you come to us, tell us about your project and include what you're working on so that we know how to um, address your agreement and how to get you through the process as quickly as possible. Here's my fancy one. I don't have a do not pass go, and I was looking for one, I'll have you know. <laughs> So, so the really good news is, is a lot of the information we require, you're already pulling together for the county and that's gonna be very helpful to you and that's also gonna be very helpful to us because the level of detail that, they're ask, that the county is asking for is the level of detail that we need. And most frequently, when people come to us, they provide us with a very minimal project description and we can't make any progress with that. So that stops the process right there and then we have to come to you and say, give us some more information. So when you come to us, provide us with these detailed site plans, provide us with your detailed project description that you're providing to the county and that's gonna work very well for all of us and to help you through the process. So the process, you have two options when you come to the department. We have a paper process and we have an online process and I'm gonna walk through the online process and then tell you about the paper process in just a moment. First thing you have to do is come to our website and register. 
this is my name, this is where I am. And then we come back and say, we accept your registration. And then you come and you provide us with this pre-notification or this application information. And you can see some of the things that we require there. Again, this is where you bring in your project description. This is where you come and you tell us what uh, BMOPs you're doing. And um, you provide this information. And the more information you provide us, the faster and easier this process will go for both of us. Once you provide, um, if we're gonna go down the center path here, um, provide us this basic informa information. Um, there are a couple of questions. You look at the questions and determine where your facility fits into those questions. One option you may be given is to self-certify. When you self-certify, um, you check the boxes and you sign it and then the department looks at your information that you provided and at that point we may just provide you with um, a letter stating that no agreement is necessary. And that's what everyone calls them waivers. It's not technically a waiver, it's a letter stating you don't need an agreement. You can take that to CDFA and you're good to go from our perspective. So that's one process for self-certification. This self-certification process is typically for very simple Simple setups. Um, if you're in a warehouse building on municipal water with municipal sewage, you're more likely to be able to get through the self-certification process. Other types of pro uh, facilities do go through that process as well, but the simple ones are the ones that go through that process and it's pretty quick. The other um, process is the general agreement and you provide us with all that uh, great information that you gathered for the county. And um, the first thing you need to do is read the general agreement. This is like, uh, it's just an, it's an agreement with predetermined conditions. And when you sign online that you want a general agreement, you are saying that you will comply with all of the um, components and conditions that are in the general agreement. So I r highly recommend you read it first so that you know what you're, um, what you're getting yourself into. It's not, nothing terribly difficult, just we want you to be aware because we do intend to do compliance checks, follow-ups, making sure that you're following these conditions. So once you provide all that information and you say, yes, I want a general agreement, um, fish and game, or fish and wildlife, excuse me, we take a look at it and you're issued a general agreement, you take your general agreement to the California Department of Food and Ag and you're done. If your project, your program, doesn't meet the criteria of a general agreement, you may be asked to go through the standard agreement process. And the difference between the standard agreement and the general agreement is your general agreement is all kind of pre-written. And you sign it and we go, here you go. When you go to the standard agreement process, it's not a bad thing. It just means that we're gonna work with you as an individual and site specifically to help you develop the conditions in your agreement. We're gonna have that conversation. It's a one-on-one -on -one process. So that's, that's the primary difference between those two. They're both five-year programs or five-year agreements. You can get them for up to five years, so that's not different. Um, but that standard agreement process gives us the opportunity to work with you as individuals and uh, work specific to your project. Uh, if you want a paper application, you can contact us and we'll send you a paper application. Your only option with a paper application or paper notification is the standard agreement. So uh, the, the county that you work, the, the who you work with is dependent on your county. I'm assuming you're all Santa Cruz County. You'll be working with the Bay Delta region. That's our general phone number. The people who work specifically in Santa Cruz County are here and I'll introduce them before I leave. And we'll be available in the hall to um, answer your questions as best we can. We have a lot of experience between the whole team. And what if you don't? What if you decide it's just too much work? There are penalties, there are fines, and they are significant. Be aware of that and take that into consideration. You need to protect your business and come into compliance. There are people who love their code. Here is the code. <laughs> <laughs> it's, on the, it's online, you can look it up. But these are the code um, sections that we typically use when we are working through this process with you. So. The takeaway message is get a permit, work with us, we wanna work with you, we want to bring you into compliance. It's a challenging time what we're going through of moving, moving into this um, more standardized process 
And so come talk with us. Let's protect your investment. Let's protect California's natural resources. And I believe we can do this together. And I believe that the state can have both a prosperous cannabis industry and we can protect this unique, amazing place where we live. And I know we can do this together. So just come and talk with us and let's start that conversation. And here we are. And I wanna point out the people, they're gonna love me for this. So Andy Rock River right here, this is Santa Cruz County. He's our supervisor, Stephanie Holstedge. She is my counterpart in Santa Cruz and hiding behind the Redwood is Corey. <laughs> Gray, and Corey is awesome. She's on our uh, watershed enforcement team. She has a lot of information. She is very experienced and can help us all out very much. So that's what I have for you today. And thank you very much. And I look forward to working with all of you. Oh, and one more plug. We have uh, informational meetings coming up that are uh, fish and wildlife focused starting in late June. July. <laughs> so as soon as we get that information uh, available on our times and dates, we'll let you know so you can come join us and we'll talk more in detail about the processes that we're working through. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was really a fantastic presentation. Oh, and uh, yeah. I slept last night. <laughs> can we share that PowerPoint on our website? Yes, and we are gonna put that PowerPoint on our website as well as the other talks today, just so you all know. Um, so now we're gonna switch over to water, the theme of water in a little more detail with the State Water Resources Control Board and the Regional Water Quality Control Board who work together um, to implement the um, state's cannabis water um, program. And so I wanted to point out that Brian Moore with the State Water Board is here. He's with the Department of Water Quality. He won't speak. He's in the audience, but he'll answer your questions in the hall. He's not a speaker today. He will speak to you. He's not a speaker. Um, <laughs> he's a water resource control engineer. And then we also have from the State Board, Roberto Cervantes. <laughs> and uh, he's a senior, senior engineer with the Division of Water Rights for Cannabis, and he's gonna, he is going to speak here up here today. And then we have Leah Lemoyne with the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and she's a water resource control engineer um, with the Irrigated Lands um, Regulatory Program. So they're gonna talk to you in tandem about what they have to say about water. Here we go. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just gonna dive in here. So we'll talk about what the water board's sort of um, stake is in all of this, like why, why you have contact with us at all in this licensing process. Um, state board versus regional board, what's the difference? Why are there so many? Um, the cannabis general order, which is kind of the meat of this, of, of our involvement. Um, attachment A of the general order, which really dives into the requirements. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to enroll and then the water rights component um, of the general order too. So, um, so the responsibility of the water board is to ensure the effects of water diversion and discharge of waste associated with cannabis cultivation do not affect groundwater or surface water quality. So we wanna make sure that whatever's happening on site isn't going to cause pollution in surface water or groundwater. Um, the cannabis general order is a waste discharge requirement developed by the state water board um, that, and in the cannabis general order dives into Who's, who needs to enroll, who gets a waiver, and I'll go into that. Um, what type of monitoring and reporting requirements you might have. Um, what, how we determine your tier and risk assessment. Um, and then the policy, also called attachment A, has the details of what the requirements are. So write down that website and go and download the general order and read it. I'm gonna talk about some kind of high level stuff the things we get the most questions on, but it's not comprehensive at all. So you'll wanna go and read about the nitty gritty, nitty -gritty of all of the, the requirements. Um, oh, this is gonna be also provided to you, this, this presentation, so if, if you don't get it, all the pictures. So uh, who does what? The State Water Board developed the order. It's a statewide order. Every single cannabis cultivator in the state ha is subject to the same permit requirements. Um, so the State Water Board wrote the order and they also implement the small irrigation use registration which is the water rights component. So if you need a water quality waste discharge requirement, you'll be working with this regional water board. If you need a water right, you'll be working with State Water Board. Um, it's just how it got divided up. Um, so 
water board, the regional water board implements the water quality portion of it. Why do we have the order? So regions one and region five, which is the kind of Trinity, Humboldt, North Coast area, and then the Central Valley, have had regional orders for a few years now. Um, after they noticed a lot of cannabis cultivation and a lot of pollution associated with cannabis cultivation. And here's some photos of what they saw. So trash, pesticides, fertilizers stored in ways that very much posed threats to water quality. Lots of erosion, sedimentation and increased turbidity in surface water, septic waste, more septic waste, illegal surface water diversions, and reductions in flow. Um, all cannabis cultivators need to apply for coverage in some way or another. There's a few s exceptions which I'll get into, but I think a good sort of working assumption at this point is if you're a cannabis cultivator, you're gonna wanna come to us. Um, so let's see, it's in the regional board, myself and my colleague James, who's not here, but you'll I'm sure have contact with him at some point, likely. Uh, we sort of implement the day-to-day, -day. We'll, we'll do site visits, we issue the notice of applicabilities, we'll sort of assist with compliance assistance. Um, so you'll most likely be dealing with us. So who is applicable? All commercial cannabis cultivators must apply for coverage. The, if you're an outdoor site greater than 2,000 square feet, you will enroll as tier one or tier two. If you're an outdoor site less than 2,000 square feet, um, you're considered conditionally exempt. You apply for coverage, but you'll get a waiver. If you're an indoor site, and a truly indoor site, meaning you have a concrete or asphalt or otherwise impermeable floor, you're also considered conditionally exempt and you get a waiver to the WDR. Um, a greenhouse with a dirt floor is, is considered outdoor, yeah. Um, personal use exemption does exist. If you're a personal use grower and you're not selling, you don't have to come to us at all. You're legally exempt. Um, the exemptions don't limit our um, ability to come and inspect you. So if you're an indoor grow or you're less than 2,000 square feet, but we notice that there may be activities on site that are impairing water quality, we still have the authority to come and do an inspection. And then if we realize that you're not meeting the conditions of the order, you may be required to enroll at that point. I touched on this, and it's something that we're seeing is tripping up a lot of growers, maybe less so in Santa Cruz, where there's less, fewer greenhouses, but in order to be indoor, you have to have a permanent structure and a relatively impermeable floor. So concrete, asphalt, something like that. Con compacted dirt is considered, imper is considered permeable, and so that would be an outdoor grow for, for, the, for the order, yeah. I'm sorry if it's confusing. <laughs> um, so if you're a greenhouse, you have a dirt floor, you're gonna be tier one or tier two. Okay, another thing that's tripping up some folks, so it's good to get ahead of it. Um, if you're an indoor grow, truly indoor grow, you're gonna have three options on your application to choose where your waste is going. Uh, a community sewer system, on-site treatment, something like a septic, or, or you can store and haul. Um, if you, some of these may require additional permitting. So the general order, coverage under the general order doesn't necessarily satisfy all the water board requirements. If you have a septic system, typically they're um, regulated by the county. Sometimes they're not, depends on the number of folks it's servicing. So just come to us and we'll figure it out. If there's any industrial waste going into the septic system, that makes things a lot more complicated. You'll definitely wanna come to us. It should only be domestic waste. Um, and now this next bullet applies to indoor and outdoor grows. If you have RO residual, um, some kind of filter wash water, any kind of filter water residual, um, and, and on-site treat, treatment systems that are generating industrial waste um, also come to us because that could require additional permitting. So just email us and ask and we'll figure it out. Um, okay, so here's how to figure out what tier you're in. Less than 2,000 square feet or truly indoor, you're conditionally exempt. 2,000 square feet up to an acre is tier one. More than one acre is tier two. Um, 
and beyond that, you're assigned a risk designation. If you're, with, if you're outside of the setback and on a slope less than 30%, you're low risk. If you are on a slope more than 30% but outside of the setback, you're a moderate risk. Uh, I'll get into it, <laughs> sorry. There's the next slide is about the setbacks. So the setback is referring to distance from, sorry, I should have flipped those slides, distance from surface water body stream. Um, and then the, the high risk is if you're within the setback. So I think it's in the very next slide. It's not, it's in a couple slides, but I'll get into the setback. So if you have a stream on your property, um, depending on whether it's class one, class two, or class three, which is uh, it essentially lines up with the perennial ephemeral intermittent designation that um, you guys heard about already, it can be 50, 100, or 150 feet back that you'll need to be away from that surface water. Um, so but we'll talk about that a little more in a few. So this is just broad categories that the requirements in attachment A t cover. Riparian and wetland protection and management, water diversion, storage and use, irrigation runoff, land development, soil disposal, screen, stream crossing installation and maintenance. You'll notice a lot of overlap with what CDFA is, or CDFW is gonna be looking for. Um, fertilizer, soil, soil use and storage, pesticide, herbicide application and storage, petroleum products, storage, um, you get the idea. Cultivated related, cultivation related waste disposal, winterization, winterization's a big one. Um, so I'm gonna just dive into a few of these really broadly, uh, not comprehensive at all, so go read the order and figure out what it means for your site, but I'm just gonna talk about some of the things you get the most questions about. Um, okay. So no grading on activities on slopes greater than 50% or is restricted by local ordinance or regulation. Sounds like Santa Cruz has a more stringent requirement of 35% on this one. 20, 20. So this doesn't even apply to you guys. Um, finished slopes cannot exceed 50%. We see a lot of cut slopes on sites that are just bare exposed soil like that. We don't want that. Um, Land development, road construction must be designed by a qualified professional. The order defines qualified professional. Um, incorporate erosion and sediment con detention devices and materials into the design work schedule and implementation of activities. So if you're looking at your site, you have a lot of exposed, unstabilized soil. That's something that you're gonna wanna deal with. Um, so winterization refers to getting your site ready for winter. Um, Implement all erosion and s control and soil disposal and so so spoils management requirements in addition to winterization. So all of your soil storage needs to be bermed and covered. S um, any disturbed soil just needs to make sure that's gonna stay in place when it rains, so stabilized. No operation of heavy equipment during the winter period. Um, apply linear sediment controls like these straw logs. Um, maintain culverts drop inlets, trash racks, et cetera, all before the winter period begins, stabilize disturbed areas, um, cover and store stockpile materials. Okay, setbacks. Um, this is the thing we probably get the most questions about um, because, and Heather mentioned it, you may have a stream on your site and not really, I think of it as a stream, but it is a stream um, because it only gets rain once every, or only, you only see flow in it once every year or two years. Um, so if you're near a perennial water co course, it's 150, intermittent, 100, ephemeral, 50, a man-made. If there's aquatic, native aquatic life, it's outside of the established riparian buffer. If there's no sta uh, native aquatic life, it's just the edge of the, there's no, there's no setback. So, um, and this refers to all land disturbance associated with the canvas site, including storage of vehicles, diesel-powered pump, water storage and chemical toilet placement. Um, so irrigation runoff is not allowed. See, irrigation runoff, tailwater, sediment, plant waste, or chemicals, none of these things can migrate off site via your irrigation tailwater. Um, you must keep your ins irrigation system fairly well buttoned up, no leaks, build in redundancies so there are um, safety or let's see, shut off valves, so if, if something catastrophic happens, you can deal with it right away. Um, apply irrigation water at the agronomic weight rate, which means don't water more than you need. 
in general, I feel like cannabis cultivators are pretty good about this, more so than traditional <laughs> ag. <laughs> so, no, I'm not super worried about that one. Um, and maintain your irrigation as needed, obviously. Um, the chemical storage, essentially just store it covered and um, away from the well. Um, store pesticides and fertilizers separately from your petroleum products. Um, don't store them within the setback, don't, or mix within the setback, or obviously apply within the setback, um, and use products consistent with the label. Um, there's some reporting requirements. There are two sort of flavors of reports, uh, technical reports, which are due once at the onset of your permit within 90 days of your application. And then another, depending on what tier you are, um, you may have annual reporting requirements. Um, so technical reports, depending on your tier and risk, and I have it kind of laid out here so you can, once you have an idea of where you're gonna be in terms of tier and risk, this is the num these are the reports that you may have to write. Um, and there are technical reporting guidelines in the order. It's attachment D of the Canvas Journal order, so there are pretty specific guidelines on what we need to see in these reports. Um, it's due 90 days after submitted. The exception is the site closure report, which needs to be submitted 90 days before you, you terminate your operation. Submit it to this email address in the PDF. Uh, annual reports, types of things that you may need to report annually. This only applies to tier one and tier two growers, not the waiver. Um, I didn't want to do that. Uh, winterization, confirmed tier, nitrogen application, surface water runoff stabilization, um, and there's guidance in the order as well as, as to what exactly we're looking for in this annual reporting. And you can always email us at the regional board, we can provide guidance. And they're due March 1st of each year. Um, okay, so Robert's gonna talk about water rights, and then at the end, he's gonna tell you how to enroll, which is really the, probably what you wanna know most. <laughs> so, take it over. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you, Leah. So, so what button was it? This one, huh? Yeah, oh, I've been eyeballing you guys, but from back there, I can't see it. This one here, right? Yeah. All right, cool, yeah, cool, cool. All right, hey, so um, my name is Robert Cervantes. I work for the uh, Division of Water Rights. I lead the cannabis registration team. So um, Leah talked about uh, the water quality requirements of our cannabis policy. Uh, before I dive in, I, I wanna get a quick show of hands. How many of us here have actually read the cannabis policy? All right, that's cool, I get it, I get it. Um, another quick show of hands. How many of us here divert surface water to irrigate your grow? Wow, none, all right, my time is nice meeting you, good. good, good. All, right. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the overview of how you're gonna get through the state water board process. Okay, so we have an overall overarching policy for water quality control. It's a big document, it's like this thick, weighs 100 pounds, lots of words, lots of numbers. There's two parts to it. One is water quality. The second one is water rights. Two parts of this one document. We're a small part, a checkbox if you will, on your way to getting your annual license from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. I guess I can explain it here too. There's state board, there's division of water rights, there's the regional board. This is, this is really all it is. There's a headquarters office in Sacramento for the state water board. There's nine little regional offices all spread throughout the state. They deal with water quality issues throughout the state. It's easier to deal with different water quality issues throughout the state and regional offices because watersheds and hydrology and topography is so different throughout California. It wouldn't be right to deal with it all in Sacramento. And water rights, nah, we don't care. We handle it all in Sacramento. <laughs> okay, so I apologize ahead of time. Some of my slides are a bit texty, but I'll get through them as best I can. There's two requirements, two flow requirements as they relate to water rights in the cannabis policy. One of them is called the narrative in-stream flow requirement. The other one's numeric in-stream flow. What does that mean? 
The narrative in-stream flow requirement means we want you to bypass 50% of the flow in your surface stream when you're diverting. You're looking at a stream flow. We want half of that going by after your diversion. We don't want you sucking up the whole stream. The numeric in-stream flow, that's a little bit different. Our team of scientists and engineers is developing an online tool so that every cannabis cultivator that's diverting surface water, not many of us in this room, but you will get online and you will click where your point of diversion is in a GIS map. It's, pr and it's pretty interactive, it's, it, it's cool. It's not up yet, but we're working on it. Based on your point of diversion, we're going to assign a gauge to you. A gauge is a little instrument in the water that tells you how much water is flowing past it. If there's enough water in the stream for you to divert for your cannabis grow, turn your pumps on. If there's not, don't. All right, so I think this is where we all live here, groundwater. It's a challenging issue for us at the Division of Water Rights because the State Water Board does not have permitting or reporting authority over groundwater. So that means we don't give you groundwater permits to install your well. You go to the county, you get your permit, the driller comes out, 200 feet later, you hit water, you're good, you start pumping. Now, here's the thing, oftentimes what we think is true percolating groundwater is actually hydrologically connected to surface water. All right, okay, well, what are we gonna do about it? If we find over time, not a year, probably not two years, maybe five years, I don't know, if we find that at some point aquatic base flows, that means the minimum amount of water in the streams to support fish and wildlife is being adversely impacted by groundwater wells, there's a caveat in the policy that may allow us to do some about it. What that means is that we may come through at some point in the future and say, hey, groundwater well users, you know what? We're gonna need you to turn your pumps off in the summer. Pump in the winter, just like the surface water diverters stored in tanks leave as much water in the, in the stream in the summer as you can because we're drying down the surface water. Hasn't happened yet. This is just something that may happen in the future. Maybe it won't. But there's three targets, three triggers that would make us evaluate groundwater users. The first one would be if there is a large cluster of groundwater wells in an area and the aquatic base flow in that area is low, consistently low. We would look at those. The second trigger would be if there are a large number of riparian users, so they're, they're, they're diverting surface water, tired of it, a large cluster of those riparian users switch to groundwater wells, we may look at that. The third trigger would be if there's an area that the aquatic base flow is consistently low and we don't even know why. That could be another, the third trigger that would uh, uh, have us look at uh, and evaluate groundwater, groundwater well users. All right, here's another fun one, and there may be some of us here too. Fully contained springs. It's kind of hard to explain from a technical standpoint what we mean by that, but this is what, here's my take on it. It's water that daylights on your property and never runs off. When I say never, I mean under natural circumstances, never ever runs off your property. Not because you dug a big pond around it, not because you built a diversion box and you have a pump on top of it. That's not what I mean by never flowing off your property. I mean like there's nothing around this spring and it never ever flows off. That's fine. You can use that fully contained spring to irrigate your grow. We just want you to show us that it's really fully contained, meaning it's not hydrologically connected to the broader watershed. How do you do it? 
you hire a geologist. We are going to, and I mean it really, it's like a licensed geologist or licensed hydrogeologist. We're gonna have uh, some guidance on our website in the next, nah, two to three weeks. It could be two to three government weeks, so I don't know, maybe, but you know, you get it. Anyway, we just want to have some technical documentation that the spring is not hydrologically connected to the rest of the watershed. All right, this is where we are right now. The first year, I used to call it first year free. And what that means is that for this first year, you're able to divert in the summer. From here on out, you're not gonna be able to. You're gonna need to turn your pumps off on April 1st. You can turn them back on on November 1st. But for this first year, if you get a water right, we're going to, if, <laughs> if you get a water right before you start diverting, you can divert water for this first summer while you're building your storage. We realize it takes time to build a reservoir to get tanks. We get it this first summer, get it done. But you can divert while you're building that now. All right, this is that gauge assignment that I spoke about a moment ago. You're gonna be able to get online and see what gauge is assigned to your area. And from that gauge, it's gonna be like a red light or a green light. Green light, turn your pumps on. You can divert that day. Red light, don't turn your pumps on. There's not enough water in the stream. That's what this is. And we'll message all of this. As these, as these tools come online and as information becomes available, we're gonna message this to the cultivation community. Hey, water boards, uh, gauge assignment tool is online, or the uh, fully contained spring guidance is now available online. So it, we won't be operating in a vacuum. Everybody's, well, we hope everybody's gonna know through our messaging, and I'll get into that a little bit later too. All right, so this is the program that I run the Small Irrigation Use Registration Program. So this is where I live. I've got a team of nine scientists, engineers, and analysts that feverishly work every day processing cannabis cultivation applications. All right, so I mean, like this is it right here. D do I need a water right? Like what am I even doing? What do I, do I need one? Okay, here's the answer. If you divert surface water, or you divert water from a subterranean stream, yes, you need a water right. But if you have a fully contained spring, if you have percolating groundwater, if you're part of the groundwater recordation program, nobody is in Santa Cruz County because it's only in Southern California, um, you don't need a water right. Um, if you live in an adjudicated watershed, you do not need a water right. Does anybody know what an adjudic adjudicated watershed is? All right, I'll tell you. I don't know if there's any in Santa Cruz County, but what it means is all the neighbors get together, they sue each other, and then a judge determines who gets how much water and when. If you live in one of those watersheds, you don't need a water right. Water purveyor, so if you get water from City of Santa Cruz or County of Santa Cruz Water District, I just made that up. I don't know if those districts really exist, but if you have a municipal water purveyor, you don't need a water right. Or if you have a rainwater catchment system, no water right for that. When I say rainwater catchment, I don't mean you go out in the back and grade two acres and lay down tarp or visqueen plastic. Don't do that, that's not what I mean. What we mean by rainwater catchment, rooftop. Rooftop rainwater catchment. Um, if you have a low spot in your, on your property and it doesn't channelize, Water doesn't channelize before it goes in that pond. It's all surface flow that goes in there. That's a rainwater catchment pond. You can have that and you don't need a water right. All right. So there's two kinds of water rights that we issue from my team. One is an irrigation, I call it a certificate because that's what you get at the end is a certificate. We have an irrigation certificate that's what you need for cultivation of commercial cannabis. We also have a domestic certificate. So if you have a house on your property that you grow on, but you also use that surface water diversion for your home, you gotta come in and get a domestic certificate as well. 
If you have six plants or less, we don't even want to know about it. Those are yours. But if you have seven plants or more, <laughs> we think you're a commercial cultivator at that point. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> All right. When do you need to do this? I tell people, do it now. We worked on an online application system. It's gonna take you about an hour and a half to get through it. There's no reason to wait. Get the water right now. It'll take you an hour, like I said, an hour and a half to get through it. Um, from the time you pay, you have a month to pay. After you pay, it'll get, take us about two weeks to get you your actual certificate. Um, this summer, if you plan to divert surface water this summer to irrigate your grow, totally get your water right now. You have to. All right, so this is the slide that my team and I exist by. This is it. These are the rules here. You gotta comply with the general conditions. And uh, we have a, a, a application set up similar to Fish and Wildlife where it's just a general set of 25 conditions. If you comply with these 25 conditions, you're good. There's no site-specific work that we need to do. Just follow the 25 conditions. Get the, the small the SIUR, Small Irrigation Use Certificate in our, us and our acronyms, right? Small Irrigation Use Certificate, you get that through our online portal. You also get the water quality permit through our online portal. That's what Leah does. She and her team go out and inspect your site, but in, before you do that, you gotta come into this portal and get your water quality per permit. They call it a notice of applicability. That's a lot of, like, a lot of, syllables for me to say, I just say water quality permit, because that's how I think of it. Just like a water right, you get a water quality permit, same thing, they'll go out and expect your site once you get that. You get it through the same portal though. The max amount of water you can have per year, 6.6 .6 acre feet, and this is for surface water diverters only. I know there's a lot of groundwater folks in here, but 6.6 .6 acre feet of water per year. And it's weird, right? Like why not 6.7 or why not 6.5? I didn't make that number up. The maximum diversion rate is 10 gallons per minute and that's in pursuant, or that's pursuant to our cannabis cultivation policy. That's the max diversion you can have from your pump, 10 gallons per minute. Well, if you multiply that by the number of days in the diversion season, it's 6.6 .6 acre feet per year. Multiplication, I can do that. Now you can, there's, you can turn your pumps on November 1st, keep them on through March 31st. So at 11.59 p.m. on March 31st, turn your pump off. The forbearance period, which means the dry season, the summer, April 1st through October 31st, you gotta keep your pumps off. All right, so you're gonna come through the portal. We ask you questions. One of those questions is, where's your point of diversion? There's a GIS map, you click it, where your point of diversion is. There's a few things that will bump you out automatically for. One, it's a full, fully appropriated stream, what's that? It's a stream that the state water board has found there's no water left to allocate. There's no water left to give, automatic rejection. Wild and scenic rivers, automatic rejection. We can't give, we can't allocate water from a wild and scenic river. And there's also these, there's two right now, that's called an in-stream flow study area. Fish and wildlife um, studies streams throughout the state and they also issue, um, I don't wanna say a warning, it's, it's more like a declaration where this stream is impacted. Um, if you take any more water out of it, it's gonna adversely impact fish and wildlife. There's two of them right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, you may not know. Butte Creek and Big Sur. Bam, I think that's what they are, but I don't know. We'll, we'll find out later. Okay, I think that's what they are right now. There's a few more coming online in future years. Also, if your point of diversion or your grow area is within 600 feet of a tribal boundary, we're gonna let you know about it. It doesn't mean you can't get your water right, and it doesn't mean you can't get your water quality permit, but it means before you grow, you need to get permission, written permission. We need to see the written permission, like signed by the tribal council, that they're okay with you growing within 600 feet of their tribal land. 
All right, so this is the portal I've been talking so much about. We spent, oh, nine months working on this. We're really, we're really proud of it. You can get to it from our website. There it is right there. And I mean, you can just get onto Google and say waterboards cannabis and th it'll, it'll bump you right there. That, that's where it'll take you. Okay, this is the overall process for applying. And this goes for both water quality and water rights. It's one portal. You just go in and you answer questions and in the end you get two things, a water quality permit and maybe a water right if you need one. Anyway, the applicant, first box, there you are, that's you. You enter, you, you register, so you give us a username and password. You answer questions. You hit submit, then we get it. We review it, see if there's any deficiencies, any further questions that we have. After we say, all right, you're fine, we send you an invoice. You pay us money. <laughs> and then after we get, <laughs> after your check clears, after we make sure the money's good, we send you your water quality permit and a water right if you, if you needed one. And then after that, we're like family. We see each other once a year at your, <laughs> at your compliance inspection. <laughs> I can't believe I said that out loud. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is the, the flow once you get in to the portal. When you get into the portal after you establish your username, your account, the first set of questions are, are geared towards screening you through, the, we call it the general order, that's the water quality permit. We ask you what some water quality questions to see if you even need the water quality permit right now. Some folks up north don't need one because they already have coverage, but for us in Santa Cruz, forget about them, you need a, you need a water quality permit. So when you answer this, these screening questions is gonna pass you through because you're gonna need the, the, the water quality permit. The next section is gonna be water rights. We're gonna ask you water rights screening, screening questions. Where's your point of diversion? What's the name of the stream? Do you have a spring on your property? The nature of your water source, that's what we wanna know in section B. We have a GIS tool that'll guide you through it all. Section C and D are applicant and property information. Addresses, names, numbers, who's doing what, where. That's section C. Section D, um, that's for the Division of Water Quality. They wanna know site-specific stuff like what's the area of your grow, um, what's the slope of the property, things like that. Section E, see how it's really long, like longer than the rest? Those are Division of Water Rights questions. We're control freaks. We like to know everything. We love data. So we ask a bunch of questions. But it's okay because we guide you through them. It's, it's, they're not questions that you wouldn't already know. And before you even get into this uh, portal, we have a checklist of, I don't know, 12 things that you need before you come in. Really follow the checklist. Have the stuff first. But if you don't, you can just log out, get the stuff and then log back in, whatever, you have an account. At the end, we talked about it, you pay, we give you stuff. The water right and the notice of applicability, which is the water quality permit. Okay, this is what it looks like. There's the water right. You're gonna get a couple things from us. You get the actual water right certificate and the GIS map that you created. You guys are gonna create one of those. And I'll give you an A plus, every one of you. All right, wait, let's go back. Okay, that is what the notice of applicability letter looks like. Division, uh, the uh, Division of Water Quality doesn't let you build a map like we do, but they'll still give you a piece of paper if you give them money. Okay, how many of us are on social media? Everybody like Instagram or Facebook? Please, just somebody raise your hand. Please, yeah, all right, yeah, all right. Follow us, our handle is at Waterboards Cultivation. We post stuff on there, cool pictures. Um, we do polls. We like to know um, what people are having difficulty with from the application standpoint. Um, why are our fees so high, things like that, and we'll answer. You won't like the answer, but we'll give you an answer. 
Okay, there's the contact information. There's Leah, you know her. Stayboard, Robert, that's me. And Brian Moore is my buddy up front. He's from the Division of Water Quality in Sacramento. I believe that's all we've got. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you for that fantastic explanation of the state water requirements. And I think it's just clear that with some exceptions, a lot of our process and the planning and um, cannabis licensing side uh, will help you very much when you go to the state for the things that Fish and Wildlife are gonna need, the regional board, the state board. So I hope you have confidence in that, that a lot of the material you prepare for us will be very useful and immediately applicable to the state. And now Melody's gonna take over. Okay, well welcome to the wonderful world of cannabis legalization. You know, as we said, when we first started this process about five years ago, one day you're gonna be standing in this chambers and you're gonna be complaining about the water boards and the planning commission and this and that, and it's here. <laughs> okay, so right now we wanna take some time and ask um, uh, the opportunity for you to ask some questions again not site-specific questions because nobody's gonna be able to help you with that, but if you have some general questions about processes, procedures, who to talk to, that sort of thing, we're gonna um, do that. And then, of course, are you guys gonna return to your tables outside afterwards and then you can ask some site-specific questions outside. So anybody have general questions and I'm gonna call on you. Anybody? State, state and local questions, whatever your questions are. I have a, a question uh, for Roberto and uh, also for the county. Um, regarding fully appropriated streams, the San Lorenzo River is fully appropriated in the summer. Uh, this forbearance year, you're still not gonna allow people to divert during the summer, right? Should I answer? Yeah, from the, from the microphone, All right, it's televised? Yeah. <laughs> 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 she did, yeah, yeah, she didn't tell me till after, right? That's cool. So you, you, what river? San Lorenzo River. San Lorenzo River is fully appropriated. The summer from June 1st through uh, October 31st. Okay, and your question was, can you divert? Uh, I just want to clarify, you said that there will be a forbearance period waiver this yeah, first year. Yeah, right, okay, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Okay, so the fully appropriated stream declarations we have may or may not coincide with the cannabis forbearance period. Oftentimes they do. There's no water in the summer and a lot of streams. And it just so happens that for the cannabis policy, we don't want you using water in the summer. Now, right off the top of my head, I don't know what the dates for the fully appropriated declaration is for San Lorenzo. June, It'll be June 1st through June October one, 31st. Okay, okay, so it, almost coincides with the cannabis policy. Um, it sounds like that for San Lorenzo, you would not be able to divert at all because the cannabis policy says, turn your pumps off April 1st through October 31st. Right, so this, this first year you're having a waiver of that though, but I just wanna- Oh, well, 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 okay. So we're having a waiver of that for requiring a water right but nobody can divert for any purpose for a fully appropriation. You could be growing grapes, corn, berries, doesn't matter. If it's fully appropriated during some season, you can't divert during that season for anything. And then uh, SoCal Creek is adjudicated. You said you don't need a license, but that means you have to have- Follow the adjudication. Do what the judge says. Right, okay, good. And then uh, uh, the county in their recent uh, past, uh, code has a forbearance period as well, and that is not, it's my understanding that that would not be waived on the first year, right? So even though the state is waiving their first year, the counties does not have language waiving their forbearance period. I, so if the county has I, one, it so would be more. Say, okay, right, right. I just, I just wanted to jump in real quick before we say we are broadly waiving the first year forbearance you gotta get your water right in order to do that. So you can't just start diverting and say, oh, well, it's the first year, it's, it's cool, it's not. You have to get your water right, and then you can start diverting. This one summer, now, but that's it. Now for the county, I don't know. 
Yeah, the intention of that was to match the state and we will match the intent of that regulation, which is to match state water board intent. And we defer to the state essentially. Okay. And, we'll, and we, we will impose those regulations according to that. Okay, there's, there's some issues with that because we, we are in a, we have water restrictions right now. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk to the board about that, I guess. Thank you. Anybody else questions? General questions? Great, hi Jeff. Uh, while we're talking about water, just wanna make sure, uh, if, if we're on a well though, um, we still need to apply for the water quality certificate, is that correct? Okay. Right, now that, that's a good question. Yes, so you go into the, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, the camera. All right, oh, is that it right there? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so um, everybody needs to get the water quality permit. Doesn't matter if you're diverting surface water or groundwater. Everybody needs to come into the portal to get at least the water quality permit. Not everybody's going to need a water right. So it sounds like in your case, you're on a well. We're gonna ask you what's your source of water. You're gonna check the box groundwater well, we're gonna say, cool, you don't need a water right, continue on to get your water quality permit. But do you apply for protection at this time? Because that's the next question is. Protection from what? I don't know, that's what I wanted to know. On the I wanna know too, protection from what? What, what are we talking about? Portal, it says, where do you get your water? You put groundwater well, and then it says, are you applying for protection at this time? It asks another question, it's kind of confusing. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. So um, I know we ask you, I know because I, I coded it, so I'm trying to think like, well, did I ask something weird? I don't know, we ask what is your source of water? You click what your source of water is. Groundwater, you have a well? Okay, so it's gonna pass through. Then we want you to a answer questions regarding your water quality permit. Oh, I know what you're, so you're, you're asking, well, am I already covered? Do I already have coverage under the general order? Do you live in Santa Cruz County? You do not. Okay. Answer no. Very important for people to know. I agree, answer no. no. Nobody in Santa Cruz County has current coverage under the general order. It's only for folks in like Humboldt, yeah. Mendocino County, Sha Shasta County, no not Shasta County, but up north, so we Trinity County. For coverage at this time. Yes. Okay, that's, that's a big deal. Like that, I had to refill the application out because I'm like, uh, I don't know, am I applying for coverage? Yeah, yeah, everybody in Santa Cruz County is applying for general order coverage, which is the same thing as a water quality permit, same thing as notice of applicability. Say it again, general order coverage, same as notice of applicability, same as water quality permit, it's all the same thing. Everybody in Santa Cruz County needs to do it. You answer that you do not have coverage under a general order, so you actually answer no, because nobody in Santa Cruz County does have current coverage no, under the a general order. Are you applying for coverage at this time? So I think it would be yes. Uh, all right, here we go. <laughs> Jumping in. Thanks for saving me, dude. All right, that's uh, section A, question one. It says, "Do any of these things apply to you?" And one of them is, you know, I'm covered under the general order. I'm covered under regional order. I want a site-specific WDR, which nobody wants. So you want to se select no, because anyone in Santa Cruz County will not be covered in the, any of those conditions. So that's question A, section, section A, question one. Yeah. Answer no. Answer no. Other questions? Uh, this question's um, I'm bumping up against something right now for uh, on the state app. It's actually the, the last thing besides the um, the local license, and that's CEQA. And they they specifically say um, to um, attach the evidence of CEQA, or if no evidence of CEQA approval exists, 
the local jurisdiction and the local jurisdiction did not prepare a CEQA document. Applicants are responsible for preparing the required environmental compliance document in compliance with CEQA. So we're to, they're, uh, we're just stuck again. I'm familiar with that, and and that is a subject that I've been talking to folks at um, CDFA about. They're also aware there are a couple of different things that the state is doing to make sure that folks who are in operation for our purposes and, and I guess to some extent theirs can say our local jurisdiction does not have their act quite together um, and so you may be able to resubmit. I can't remember. D did you get a local letter? No? Yeah, I got a local okay. letter, so you think I could just resubmit that? Because they, they just acted like there's, they're all, ask your county again, they have it. And I'm like, no, they don't. <laughs> no, we don't, because seek was not done until you have your use permit and go through the, the planning process, the, the you know, um, process that we go through together. Um, so there's no CEQA determination yet um, for any individual projects. What we, um, the, the conversation that I'm having with the state is, uh, number one, they're considering a couple different options, maybe just doing a blanket extension of temporary licenses. That's one possibility. They haven't landed. Um, they could also have you resubmit your temporary license application. Um, and there's some stuff in between. What I'm, I'm probably, well, so, so I can, I can um, change the existing letter that we've been um, giving f to folks to include a piece on CEQA and say each individual applicant will be required to comply with CEQA. At this point, you know, this person is here just like the, the temporary letter and I, I mean, if you don't understand or, or know what we're talking about, um, let me know, but um, these are folks that for cultivators who went through our pre-license inspection process, who um, have a tax account downstairs, are paying or reporting taxes, and generally comply with the regulations, you're in good standing, and we've been providing letters that you submit to the state. Um, those are running out, like I said before, and people, the, the, the way the state set it up is if you wanted an extension, you had to make your annual application, and that's where the CEQA question comes in. I think the most important thing to understand is that the state totally <laughs> understands uh, that this is happening and that there are lots and lots of folks in many jurisdictions in the same, uh, in the same boat. Um, there are plenty of jurisdictions that are behind us or right where we are and, and don't have a way of saying this person has complied with CEQA. So they will, my, I, I can't speak for them, but my understanding in the conversations that we're having is that they will accept either a resubmitted um, letter or maybe a letter that has a new paragraph um, that says, again, you know, per the exemption that the state legislature gave me, we have deferred CEQA for each individual applicant. This, these folks won't get a license until they go through CEQA. Rest assured they will comply. Does it make sense to have a consultant start working on that? Work on the the CEQA review on the project. Don't even don't waste. There's time nothing yet. to review. It's a, it's about your project. So I mean, you you can, We do CEQA, so you can certainly if you can talk about your project with consultants. You can have people do different components, but. You're getting a little ahead of yourself if we haven't even sat down and talked about the, the scope of work. Now, if you went through the PLI, we know a lot about your site and, and some site conditions, but we have to apply these regulations to you. So you are not, you will, we do the CEQA analysis. You, you provide information that helps us with that. So you'll have a biotic report, um, the BMOP, all of those are mitigations that came out of the EIR. So you can certainly talk about which of those will apply to you and who you need to contact. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't want you to get too far ahead of that process until we've sat down and, and helped you um, figure out what the permitting and licensing process means for you. So you, there's some stuff that you can do now, at least having the conversations. I just don't want folks to be committing huge amounts of, of resources until we've gone back over with the rules now practically in hand um, and said, okay, these are the things that maybe you didn't think about or maybe you went in this direction and we kind of want you to move over here. 
Does that okay, make sense? So, yeah, no, totally. I mean, it makes sense to me. I know where we're at. I just wanted, I, for some reason, CDFA doesn't seem to get it right now. The, the state, <laughs> I don't want to speak ill of my state brothers and sisters. They, they're as befuddled as any agency. I, I mean, they just are, you know? They, they the, the voters acted and they went, oh my God, we better hurry up and get this together. They're not together. They have three agencies that, that don't even talk to each other. They're getting there. They really are. And, and when I have conversations with folks, um, you know, they're, they're very earnest. Like they're not, you know, <laughs> suffer. Like they really are trying to get it together. They're just having to ramp up and do stuff they've never done, just like us, and figure out how it all works in a way that's fair, that, that, that doesn't ruin the trust that we have with our non-cannabis, uh, you know, constituents. So they know the problem, they will come up with a fix, and, and we can help, and, and we talk to them all the time. So we'll figure it out. Anybody else? Okay, Jim. Okay. Um, I just noticed uh, during the um, PowerPoint on distribution, um, I didn't notice, but it went by fairly quickly, that SU and TP may not have been listed for distribution. So um, I'm not sure what was up there. Um, I'm not gonna go back and try to find it right now, but SU and TP, as long as your subordinate I mean, if you're existing and subordinate and incidental to the licensed cultivation on the property, one could distribute one's own, own product. But okay, SU and TP cool. were never intended for distributing broadly. But self distribution. Self distribution. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where you can grow and manufacture, you can do self distribution. Okay. And then also, as we're coming up on this next wave of state licenses and such, um, our intention is to uh, pursue the micro business and just wanted to see if uh, where the county's at. Well, we have, we have a process for vertical integration. Um, we don't disallow it, but you need to go through the licensing and permitting process to be evaluated for such a request. But right now, everybody should remember that you need to freeze, not move. It's kind of that game right now. Don't expand, don't set up new operations. I know you're eager to get going and fully operate, but you gotta stay in your confined space where you are, and then when you get your light, when you get through the permitting process, you're gonna have your CEQA review by the government agency, you'll be evaluated for this concept of vertical integration, or if you co-locate with others. We're gonna capture all of that, all of that at one time during a review. That's our goal with you, but you know, I think you're a little ahead there. Okay, you don't have a cool. business license back, right? Yeah. So you have to per se. So right now it's all a car and eventually we can combine them. Well, when you come in for, I should say, when you come in for your license, um, I'm not sure how they'll break up the fees for the cannabis licensing office, but at least for land use permitting, when you come in for a permit, you're gonna claim everything you wanna do. If you wanna distribute your own, have a CO2 manufacturer and you wanna grow, you would describe that all at once in a lump projects, you know, description, and you would get approval for that. So, you know, you'll get your different licenses broken up, but the land use permitting evaluation will be at one time, and you take it to the state, and they would give you your different state licenses. Does that make sense? I, th I think so, and right now, if we have the a la carte authorization letters, we could actually apply at the state for the micro business with each one of yeah, those. Three different business types. Yeah. If you have the three of the four that they require. Yeah, and I think so the micro business goes through cannabis control and then takes, even though you're cultivating, you're no longer in CDFA. So. Correct. But that's all state questions you should so talk to exactly the state about. So. Okay, cool. Hi. Um, my question has to do with fish and wildlife. Is it my understanding, am I understanding correctly, that um, everybody needs to register with you, whether or not there's a creek or a listed species or any sort of? Yes. Yes, <laughs> okay. Yes, if, if you're cultivating in the state, you need to notify us, you need okay. to apply with us, and we evaluate where to go from there. Okay, thanks. And then, let's see, next question I have is, I guess for everybody, is that, Hi, everybody. Is so let's say you start off with a small business, you get all your permitting, you register with everybody, you get all your certifications, and then, you know, years down the line, you get a new permit to expand your business. 
you, I'm assuming you have to come back and re-register when with any sort of amendment or change to your use permit that you have with the county. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, the county, just like any other, um, you're on TV. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so so a couple of things on that. You know, if you know what you envision your, your, your business to be and to look like, um, and we always say this, <laughs> I always say this, in planning, um, ask for what you want, right? Trying to piecemeal, and, and, and some of this is a function of, of your budget and the, and the you know, economics of what you're trying to do, but to the extent that you can, um, put it down and, and ask for the whole thing, because if you have to come back, then you're really redoing a lot of stuff, and, and you're amending that use permit that you got. You have to, um, the, the environmental review changes, um, and, and it really is not cost effective or efficient. So um, when, you're, when you're putting together your scope of work, your, your project description, um, put it all out there. Don't say, you know, I really want this, but yeah, they might not, you know, go for that. I'm just gonna, this little teeny tiny, thing over here, don't look over here. Tell us everything, and we'll tell you if it's feasible or not from our perspective, we'll tell you what it means, but don't don't hide the ball, because it, it really isn't worth it. For elder cultivation, one of the annual reporting requirements is confirming tier status, which basically means is your disturbed area still your disturbed area? Have you expanded? If you have, it may bump you into a higher tier, maybe a lower tier if you've shrunk. So. We'll modify it from year to year. And then actually the permit um, ends in 2022, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, it's actually the waivers that end in 2022. Oh, if waiver. you're enrolled under the waiver, it ends in, uh, they're five-year waivers. Mm -hmm. They were passed, I believe, in November. So five years from November. So if you're indoor, then you're gonna be required to re-enroll at that point anyways, but it's sort of, every year a little bit be re revisited. And then my last question is, has to do with the permitting process in terms of who goes first or can this all be done concurrently? It sounds like from the website, the, like the CEQA review that will be done during their use permit application portion through the county, it may be required for the other portion. So I'm just looking at timing and, and how, who goes first, who's on second, who's on third. Well, I won't give you the exact order of, um, with the state agencies who you should approach precisely when, but generally speaking, you come to the cannabis licensing office, step one, you shouldn't waste your time with the state agencies unless you're the interim in operation people that do need to, you know, anyone in operation that's diverting water, they've made it clear, come to the state. Um, and then um, otherwise, cannabis licensing is stop one before you approach planning. We don't want you approaching planning in a formal way with a submittal until you've gotten the canna clearance from us that we've vetted your project sufficiently, you can approach planning. Um, and then with the state, some of that will be concurrent when you, when you get far enough along with us that you can, you can go to the state agencies and attempt to submit what they require. It just depends on if you're an existing operator with um, interim status with a temporary state license. Okay. So it just depends on that part. Perfect, yeah. thanks. Is there anybody in the back of the room that has wanted to ask a question that hasn't gotten a chance yet? I'm gonna go back there first. If you start as an outdoor licensee and you want to phase transition to indoor, if ultimately we have a mixed light, you have to go through the permitting process for grading and construction. Does that mean we have to go apply for an indoor license before we can even go to building and planning and discuss the grading and mm -hmm. construction permits required? Not 100% sure. What, what, um, so right now you have an operation indoor. Outdoor, no, no, no. Sorry. In, intention is to yeah. get licensed for an outdoor operation, okay? okay? But ultimately, long term would be to grade and be able to put greenhouses in the same location. Based upon the, what Loretta was just saying there, so I'm kind of get, trying to get some clarity. Do we need to come to you first then and actually apply for an indoor operation before we would go to building and planning? Yes. Okay, got it. Start with us. But, but the, do you want to help here? Yeah, again, you're gonna have to go through the same process twice. If you come and apply for an outdoor uh, license, 
you're gonna go through potentially public hearing and, and all the submittal requirements and the processing and the timing for that. If you're gonna come back and say, this is the project I really want, you're gonna do it all over again. So to the extent that you can, and I get, again, you know, the economic imperatives, but you're gonna be duplicating your efforts with, with the county for sure. And to, You can start, it's gonna cost you. I mean, you can not literally start, you can, you can start the application process with us. This is my project. But you wanna apply for the whole thing. And then, and then actually on the ground, yeah, I mean, we can condition, but, but you're gonna be, we're gonna be evaluating the entire project. So the phases can be built into that. Yeah. Yeah, but we're gonna look in terms of CEQA, in terms of the impacts, we're gonna look at the ultimate build out, but you don't actually have to do that if that's, so you don't have to, so there'll be conditions of approval saying, you know, must obtain building permit for this, you know, and we can even structure it. I mean, we do this for, you know, shopping centers or whatever, like this build out here and this build out here. But the project, again, is the whole thing. So that's what you're actually applying for. And then you can structure it however you want within that. Okay, good, thank you. And this question's for Leah um, regarding the disturbed area, because I know a lot of people, myself included, are kind of confused about how to calculate that. And then um, also, is it like based on an estimate? I mean, what if you guys come out and you measure what you consider disturbed area and we miss something because we're not professionals at this and then um, you guys are like, oh, you're 100 square feet short on your disturbed area. The order defines disturbed area as your your actual canopy area plus any areas where you have soil stored. Um, so you, if, if you're off, um, the worst case scenario really is, say it, you're more than an acre and you thought you were less than an acre and we come out and we notice that, we'll just have you, we'll just change your enrollment from tier one to tier two. It's really not the end of the world. Okay, what about nursery? because there, um, there's really no described canopy area for nursery, so that's where I was getting really confused. That's a good question, Brian. Mm -hmm. Is it a, what's the facility? Is it a permanent structure and yeah, concrete greenhouses floor? Yeah, greenhouses. With a dirt floor or concrete floor? In Santa Cruz, you can't have concrete floors in, oh, your, okay. in your greenhouse, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not supposed to, not, I mean, definitely not for cannabis. For walkways, it, it's, yeah. All right, so cultivation area is pretty much the area the plant takes up, plus all the paths adjacent to those plants. So, you know, if you have a greenhouse that's gonna be full of plants, and you have all the plants, those paths adjacent to those plants, it'd probably be about the size of that greenhouse. Yeah, that, so, this is the tricky thing, is that the CDFA is defining canopy as the area where mature plants are grown. We aren't CDFA, we're the water I know, boards. so that's, I just, that's why, I, like I've read the general order and all the exhibits, and um, it's definitely confusing. Uh, maybe there should be like a little explanation on the website. Yeah, so cultivation area is the area of the plants and the paths around them. The disturbed area includes the cultivation area plus equipment storage areas, material storage areas, any other areas you're using for cannabis cultivation? I had a question in the back too. You can yeah. use that mic, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Um. Hey, it's a, it's actually a question for Leah um, concerning the uh, inspection that will be done for the wild quality cert. Um, you'll be doing presumably be doing that once on a, once a project is is built or pre-project when it's staked out, when is that gonna happen? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so once you apply, you pay, we issue the notice of applicability. We'll follow up with a, um, an inquiry to do a site visit within the next month usually. And we'll, it's kind of up to you if your site is really kind of 
in the beginning processes, it may not be worth much of our time to come and see it. We may want you to wait, want to wait a little bit until things are on, in the ground and we have a sense of what's going to happen. If you would rather us come out earlier and get some guidance on the front end, that's fine too. So it depends. We'll work with you and whatever's kind of mutual bene beneficial. So, and it's different for every site. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm kind of thinking about our process where we, you know, we submit for use permit review, which is like conceptual plans, really good site plans with all these structures illustrated as well, your cultivation area and some operational notes and your access and all that. Um, but that use permit will take quite a while to be processed. Um, during the detailed kind of grading plan, stormwater management plan that we'd require locally um, might not be available for quite a while. And, you know, I think it would help folks just kind of understand that ha process a little bit better that they might be expecting a water quality certification up front because they filed an application maybe tomorrow, you know, for your review, but it may be a year before they get to the point where they're able to submit a detailed grading plan because we're working with them on their project um, and they've citing the project, doing the BMOP things. Yeah, it's um, if you're high risk or moderate risk, if you're moderate risk and you're on a steep slope, you'll be required to d submit a disturbed area stabilization plan. May or may not in involve uh, engineered drawings. Um, so, by and large, though, growers, we don't we don't need that kind of detail. Um, and if we if you apply and your your site's really not getting built off for six months, just tell us that and we'll. We'll reach back out in six months. Um, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question on the back I, I'm confused about August 8th and the 30 days thereafter. Um, the ordinance passed the second reading on the 8th. 30 days thereafter, it becomes effective. But can any people apply for the with the planning department for use permits or anything, or do we have to wait the full 30 days till it becomes effective? So we have to sit and do nothing until the, the actual, whatever it is in next month, September, whatever it is. Yes. Okay, we, so I mean, we, there's nothing we can do, we just have to wait. You could be having conversations, you can, you know, be consulting with folks to, to help you, you know, um, figure out what you need to sort of how to orient yourself now that you're, you know, um, able to, to be familiar with the, the final product here. But until it's effective, um, it, it, it's, not, it's not live. Um, there's still a period people can appeal. There, there are, you know, uh, a bunch of different things that can happen that could take it potentially off track. I don't see any of those things happening. I think that we, we crafted a pretty good uh, compromise in, in most cases. So, but that's, that's a statutory uh, requirement that, that there's, you know, people have the ability to digest it and, and, um, and appeal and, and take us to court if they want to. Um, again, I don't anticipate that, but, <laughs> but that's what the, the, the effective date, that 30 day period, that's, it, it's okay. not it's not operational yet, and we don't want to start having people come in. Um, not least uh, reason of which uh, is that we're not entirely ready to have you come in and and do the actual application walkthrough. We're creating all those materials as we speak, but we had to wait and see what the board was going to do before we could figure out what to put in our application forms. So so we're still crafting that. Um, doesn't mean you can't talk to us and ask us questions and ask these folks questions and, and try to get your head around everything. But moving forward, not yet. So our, if our development plan were ready tomorrow, we would still have to wait the 30 days till September, to right? Formally now, submit. Yes. Okay. okay. Did you say September? <laughs> June, don't, yeah. Forget the August, September. June, it's not that far away, right? Question? So if we need to wait until June for that, does that mean you're still doing temporary license, um, or sorry, pre-license inspections? <sighs> to the extent that we, that we can, we're, we're, we're gonna run into a sort of a resource crunch, frankly, and we really wanna start transitioning into this, the application process. So there's not a firm cutoff date, but you, it's gonna be pushing folks out longer and longer because we're gonna have to be spending time doing other things. Um, the, 
the local letters we will continue to do for folks who are in operation, not expanding, not conceiving of what they want to do, but who are in operation. Um, and so, but, but that's, it's going to start to narrow. And it's just, again, it's just a resource piece um, for us. Other questions? Hi, yeah, uh, I had a question regarding the um, uh, the phase of the project layout that you all were referring to earlier and the, uh, the potential amendment to a license down the road. Um, so in the, and, and I'll do my best not to be site specific here and a little more general, but uh, in the case where you have uh, uh, a structure that needs to be refurbished in order to meet county code, uh, and potentially you would like to have a permitted nursery down the road. <clears throat> Those things need to be put into the site plan in order to be uh, processed into the licensing agreement that we're coming into. And then, but because those won't be happening in the coming year or so, that's not gonna hold up the actual personal license for a cultivator, is it? If you, if you can, if you get through and, and complete the, the use permit process, the discretionary piece with planning in, in concert with us, um, and we can get past CEQA, we can make a CEQA finding and, and, and you can get a, a decision on your use permit, but you still have, so use permits are, have conditions, right? Conditions of approval. So one of the conditions might be uh, that you need to recognize or permit structures. I know this has not applied to anybody in this room, but there are unpermitted structures all over the place out there that we have seen. And so in, in many cases, you're gonna have to decide whether you, um, whether you demolish it because it can't be permanent or it's too expensive or whatever, or that it needs to be recognized, um, or you need to build a house if you're in that kind of zone district. So what, what I envision is that you come, do all the stuff that we talked about, you meet with us, you do the pre-application, you submit your, um, you submit all your material and, and planning goes to whatever level process and you get a use approval then we could give you something like a provisional license that would allow you to keep operating or to, you know, in some cases start operating um, with, um, with our, our license, but, but it's time limited. So if, um, you know, it's gonna take you a year to legalize a structure or build a house, um, then, then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll evaluate your progress. It doesn't sort of last forever, but yeah, it takes a long time to build a house or to get a, a regular old building permit. It's not always a quick and easy thing. So, but we wanna see that as part of your project, so show those structures, and then literally on your plan, you know, this one's going away, this one needs to be legalized, that's part of your project description. And so, but those, those kinds of things, um, we don't intend to hold people up, um, but we have to get through CEQA, so we have to at least get through the use approval and have the decision maker, whether it's a ZA or it's an administrative approval, that has to be completed before you can move forward, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and one more, sorry. Oh, okay. uh, the, um, are you all are going to be requiring a licensed engineer or architect to be creating the site plans that we'll be submitting with the BMOP? Uh, submitting with the BMOP. The or the license. <laughs> I know, terminology. We'll get a glossary and just put that out there. Um, yes, these are commercial projects. And, and commercial projects require um, that plans be drawn up by either an engineer or an architect. Um, and I mean, you can have other people prepare them and somebody stamps them. I mean, there are ways, you know, to, to, um, to move forward that aren't always as cost prohibitive, but there's, it, they're commercial and that, that's part of the building code. So, and grading plans, we will require those to be prepared by a licensed uh, engineer. Um, 
Yeah, and we'll have, again, we'll have the list. Some of these, some of this information is already on the planning department website. Um, if you haven't gone to their website, um, there's just a ton of information about the processing levels, about their application flow and all that, um, in their environmental planning section. Um, there are consultant lists, there are, you know, what does a grading plan look like? There's a lot of information. So, so definitely avail yourself of what they have and, and we'll link up and make that consistent with our process too. I saw you. So I'm, I'm gonna say, who else has questions? Can you raise your hands now just so we can see how many more? So one, two, three, four, and then we're gonna call it after that so that you can meet with the people separately, okay? Hi, thanks. I just wonder if you could just give me an idea of uh, what a level five review looks like. It's a public thing. So is that we go into a room and there's a panel of people and any neighbors can show up? <laughs> and who has a, it and who terrifying. can come and speak about your, or is it somebody that's a mile away from you? Is it your direct neighbors? I'm just curious about that Excellent stuff. Excellent questions. Yeah. And, and again, some of that, um, it is is available already uh, on the on the planning department website, but um, a level five um, is the zoning administrator, um, who is a, um, an, an employee of the planning department, and it's it's one person. Um, the noticing that happens, and there's some preliminary steps that I'm that I'm kind of glossing over. But um, once your project is is complete, everything uh, you have all of the material, and you're ready to move forward, um, the planner will write up a staff report that talks about all the different components and how you are in compliance with all these different regulations, and and then we schedule a hearing in this very room. And and the, the zoning administrator will sit up there. The notice that goes out goes to all neighbors within 300 feet of your property, the perimeter. So from the property line out, um, you can go up GIS, you can see who that touches. If you don't touch enough people, if you're super remote, I think it's 10, uh, 10 people minimum have to be, so they widen that, that buffer to make sure we get at least 10 people notified. Um, and, and those folks may elect to show up and talk. They may submit written comments, just like um, the Planning Commission and Board hearings that we've had. Um, we're very much about the public process. Um, you know, it, it raises another question about what, um, you know, if you know your neighbors and there are different schools of thought, I am of the opinion that, that it's better to let people know what you're doing early on. Um, not everybody shares that, but I just think, why be surprised, you know? If you don't know your neighbors, <laughs> introduce them, or introduce yourself to them and, and let them know what's coming. If you've been there for a long time, and this is gonna apply to a lot of folks, if you've been operating on site for, for more than five years and we don't have any records of complaints, more than likely everybody's pretty cool with what you've been doing. Doesn't mean that somebody won't take the opportunity and say, oh, this is terrible, but, but they have to have real, impacts that they can articulate. They have to talk about real stuff. It can't just be, she never smiles at me. Like it, you know, so, uh, so but that's the process. And, and the, the zoning administrator, just like any other decision maker, they will take in all the information, they'll look at the staff report, they'll look at our analysis, they'll look at the conditions of approval that we applied and see if those are adequate to take care of any potential impacts like odor, for instance, which will be a very, that we're gonna talk about that a lot, I suspect, in some cases. But again, if you've been on site and you're operating, hopefully there aren't too many surprises with folks that get notification, but, but you never know what happens at a public hearing, so no guarantees there. Hi, I just had a question as to the application for the um, entitlement, um, are we, thinking that there may be a specific level five application for this particular use, or will it be the, the regular um, application that is available at this time? And then there'll just be kind of like add-ons. The application will be the same basically for, for all uh, projects. Um, Sometimes some things change um, with respect to public hearing, but but not really. It, it's um, I'm trying to think of the level fives that I've processed um, over time. Um, the 
Yeah, the, the application really will be the same. It's it's the it's the BMOP, and it's you know showing compliance with um, with all the other um, regulations that that are in our ordinance. So. Um, it, it's not going to vary too much between, you know, three, four, and five. What will vary is, you know, the, the degree of complexity of your project and, um, and, and the scope of your project. So that's what's going to define what the application materials look like and what we, so the pre-app process, you come to, to our office and, and we look at your project description and we check off the things on, on the, the application or the list of required information that you'll have to submit. We'll tell you based on your project. If you're in a warehouse on Research Park, you don't need a biotic survey, right? You're in a, you're in a you know, manufacturing zone and stuff, so there's probably not any wild critters cruising around. So, so we will tailor it to your project, but it doesn't necessarily correlate to what level. The levels are determined by, um, by the use chart, which is in the, the zoning regs. Um, and so that, that's a function of the, the zone district that you're in and the scope of your project. Sure, I'm just asking because some municipalities, they created like a specific CUP for cannabis use, so I was just wondering if that was gonna uh, anticipate it. Yes and no. I mean, there are, so there, it does live, that cannabis activities live in, in their own part of the, the use chart, and there's a separate section in the, in the zoning code that speaks to that, but the process really is not different. It's just the things that, that are analyzed are different. So yes, it has its own sort of, you know, in this district, uh, cannabis manufacturing is or isn't allowed, has a level four, level five. So it's different than other types of manufacturing or retail or whatever. Um, but, it, but the process still looks very much the same. It's, it's just, you know, what, what impacts we're evaluating are a, a, a tiny bit different, but it, it should be, and, and as we get better at this and do more of these, um, well, it'll be much, you know, much more streamlined. We have to get through a few and, you know, all sort of tag team, we'll have like a group sitting there with the first few pre-applications like, oh, oh look, there's one. And then, you know, like the planner and the, and the environmental planner from downstairs and, and these folks will all sort of, you know, put their heads together and, and, um, and figure out what needs to be submitted. Um, but it, it, it will be a lot more streamlined than it's probably sounding. But it'll be much like other types of commercial projects in, in many respects. Um, hi, Nicole Lagner, I'm an attorney. I was told I could ask a non-cultivation question. Is that correct? <laughs> Okay, um, I just wanted to know if the licensing office had gotten clarification on how the distribution tax is being imposed because several jurisdictions are saying, oh, it doesn't apply to distribution or it applies to the markup rather than to gross receipts and some jurisdictions are even defining this in their ordinance. So I just wasn't sure if the licensing office had an answer for that. Um, that's, it's actually the, the code that the tax um, uh, tax collector, uh, auditor downstairs, they sort of implement that. The way it's written right now, um, it doesn't apply, the, the, the tax does not apply to a margin. The tax, it, as it's written, it is retail sales. But it also says that you don't have to tax yourself. So if you are cultivator, distributor, retailer, you, you pay on, on that, the final sale because you're not charging yourself, presumably. Um, so we'll probably be making some, some adjustments to that if that seems problematic, but right now it, it, it doesn't account for that, that margin piece. It's just not the way that the code is written currently, um, but we'll look at changing that. Hi, I just had a quick clarification question. The gentleman up front was talking about greenhouses and how the county does not allow, or we thought that the county does not allow impervious surface for greenhouses. I have a um, commercial ag, so if I'm putting up a greenhouse, you, if I decide that I wanted to do impervious surface, it's acceptable? 
It is strongly discouraged. Okay, that's what I was looking for. That's strongly. So we're gonna try to get you to do everything you can to avoid doing that. Okay. Putting down cement or asphalt. Um, that's just the policy that also has been adopted in the best management and operational practices document and planning department will also be enforcing. Okay, for contamination purposes, mm -hmm. it would be nice to put down impervious surface, however. So those kind of justifications oh. <laughs> and in very isolated locations, you know, could be discussed. So okay. we're, we're, I think, reasonable policy, right? But um, as a general rule, just throwing down cement across um, the soil is, we don't want to do that to the native soil. Okay. And but permanently it, alter it. But... However, yes. if we wanted to do a slight layer of asphalt to avoid that contamination that, you know, weeds coming up, that kind of thing, we don't want anything germinating into our plants, is there a cost per square foot for the impervious surface we'd be thinking about putting down? A cost? In what sense? Uh, some cities apply uh, mm -hmm. square footage per... Yeah, uh, it's an impervious surface cost that per square foot. It depends on the city. Yeah. I also run permits, so I know that right. this yeah. can run between you know fifty cents per square foot. Seventy five cents is the last last time I looked. Um, but it really it, it's it's a function of a lot of different things. If you're talking about a brand new structure where nothing exists right now, um, and you are on CA land, no. Uh, that soil is the resource, okay. and if you are covering it up, you're killing all the good stuff in that soil, potentially. So, okay. no, we, we protect CA um, soil. So, would, would you be open to um, landscape tarping and three inches of uh, crushed rock or some kind of you're getting into you're getting a little granular for for you know i mean <laughs> i'm just wondering yeah i don't i i, I would have to see it and i mean and no landscape what, crush i don't know with, with i don't have a good answer the, for you i cannot answer your question okay. right now i can't um it, it but depends it's still, on it would still be pervious it depends on what it does to the soil I would just say, I mean, we, we've dealt with this um, and, and, and the ag policy folks have dealt with this. The bottom line is that we want to protect the soil. If you can put something that can be taken up at some point. So landscape tarp would be acceptable. I, I would love to see your entire project construction, review. Construction grade, not Home Depot grade. I, I'm going to say it's a site-specific question. Super site-specific, and I don't, I'm, I can't evaluate projects without more information. So it's, it's, I can't tell you, I can't give you a firm answer without knowing more about your project. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank okay, you. we're going to wrap it up then. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I want to remind you that May 8th will be the second reading for the cannabis licensing ordinances, for the non-retail ordinances. And then if everything goes well on May 8th, June 8th will be when the licensing program goes into effect. Reminder that June 8th is also the deadline for anyone who is anonymous to become non-anonymous. So you must become non anonymous by June 8th if you are anonymous and watch the website for further workshops uh, around uh, the licensing process. Thanks very much.